Start by thanking the witnesses and obviously thank you for their, their public service. I'll start with Dr. Walensky. Part of the success of the COVID-19 vaccination campaign was the gradual shift from large vaccination sites to hyper-local sites where people could find uh, vaccines in their own neighborhood. Uh, for example, like at a local pharmacy. We've seen the way in which convenient and local access to vaccines can help with uptake, whether they're uh, whether we're talking about a vaccine for a new treatment like uh, COVID-19, or tr a new threat, I should say, uh, like COVID-19, or for routine vaccines like influenza and childhood vaccines. Obviously, people know and trust their own doctor and their providers, and they respond to community-based and community member-led efforts that meet them where they are. So, Doctor, how are you working with state and local partners to make sure we reach everyone who's at risk for infection to make sure that they have the opportunity to get vaccinated if they so choose? Thank you, Senator. Uh, a really important question in terms of outreach. So early on, as vaccines were being distributed, um, we were doing it in places where people were seeking care. Many of that, many of those places were in sexual health clinics or state-run clinics where people were receiving care. It is the case that not all members of this community have told their own clinicians about um, their sexual activity. And so it's very important that we do this in a sensitive and non-stigmatizing, affirming manner. So we were doing it in places initially where people were receiving care, but then many of the lessons, again, learned from COVID as we've rolled out these vaccines and delivered over a half a million to members of these community is that we need to do more and more outreach. We learned that we need trusted messengers. We need community-based organizations. I'm pleased to say that over the last several weeks, we've sponsored uh, vaccine activities in several large-scale distribution sites like Atlanta Black Gay Pride, like Charlotte Pride, like Boise Pride, um, and like Southern Decadence. When we've done so, we We've had really successful campaigns. So in, elect, in Atlanta Gay Pride, we vaccinated over 4,200 people, similar with um, Southern Decadence, around 4, 000, uh, 3,000 people. Um, what we need to do now is do those in smaller scale, and we're actively doing that scale up in smaller scale. So rather than these big events, we need to be, meet people where they are with community-based organizations, trusted messengers, exactly as you say. Thank you. Thanks, Doctor. Um, next question will be for both you and Assistant Secretary O'Connell. We know that um, in the, the aftermath of the pandemic and, and now with the emergence of monkeypox as a public health threat, the need for ongoing dedicated investment in our nation's public health infrastructure, similar to what Chair Murray has called for in her Public Health Infrastructure Save Lives Act. Um, our state and local health departments have been struggling for years after two and a half years of co the COVID-19 pandemic and now with monkey pox on in addition to that, they simply don't have the resources they need for routine public health work. So when an emergency comes up, they have to move funds around and sacrifice from their core programming, other programming like the ongoing opioid epidemic, lead screenings, anti-tobacco efforts, cancer screenings, routine vaccinations, on and on. So how would additional sustained funding for local public health infrastructure um, help us be better prepared for new threats like a new viral outbreak. Maybe I'll start with you, Assistant Secretary O'Connell. Thank you so much, um, Chair, for this question. Uh, we continue to see states, uh, jurisdictions, their public health departments, worn out, tired, exhausted. We know they've been working for two and a half years around the clock, and we've been relying on them to distribute vaccines and therapeutics, both in the COVID-19 outbreak as well as this new monkeypox outbreak. So one of the most critical investments we can make would be in additional staffing and not just throwing supplemental funds out um, that uh, hire people but don't sustain them. It's important that we have multi-year funding uh, that supports our public health departments. It's also critical that they um, can build these systems. I talked about the HPOP system that we put in place for the SNS digitized ordering, which is interoperable, that we're no longer having them trained on something called VTRAX that CDC uh, sets up and then HPOP that HCOR sets up, but we have it on one system that talks to each other. They can order their vaccines 
in their therapeutics. By introducing that in this outbreak, we knew that the states were tired and we worked very carefully with them on uh, making sure they understood why we made this decision. And while it was hard, it does push us forward in a supportive way um, as we face this current outbreak and future ones. Dr. Walensky, I know that you might want to yeah. say more. Thank you. If I could just briefly add that um, the core public health infrastructure is key. These need to be disease agnostic and long-term sustainable rather than crisis to complacency. And I'll just give you an example that our public health partners in the states and local jurisdictions do not have a line item for monkeypox resources. They have had to respond trying to be flexible with other resources that sometimes are not legally allowed. So as you know, the key core public health infrastructure of workforce diverse as the communities they serve, laboratory infrastructure so we can scale up new labs swiftly, and then data infrastructure so we have interoperable data, just as the ASPR noted. Thank you. Thanks very much. Senator Paul. 